In the evening of June the 21st, 1985, 24-year-old Stein Huseby boarded the Brathens Safe Flight 139 at Trondheim Airport, flying to Oslo. Just after takeoff, he surrendered a flight attendant with his gun and demanded to be connected to the pilots. Then he said to them, I have explosives placed in the toilet rooms. No one would be hurt if you cooperate. His demands were simple. First, the flight should continue to Oslo Airport as planned. Second, he demanded to speak to the Prime Minister Kara Willock and Minister of Justice Mona Roque about his terrible treatment by authorities since he left prison. But none would agree to his demands. Huseby drank terribly as the negotiation dragged on. The plane landed in Oslo Airport 15 minutes late and parked 700 meters from the terminal building. After one hour, Huseby released 70 hostages in exchange for having the aircraft being moved closer to the terminal building. 30 minutes later, the remaining passengers were released, leaving him and the five crew members on board. At this point, he has already finished the plane's entire beer supply. While waiting for his demands to be met, he asked for more beer, and the police officers on the ground demanded he should trade his gun for it. He suspected it might be a trap, but he couldn't help his hunger for the beloved beer. He agreed and threw out his gun. The plane was immediately stormed, and Huseby was arrested. That's crazy, right? Don't go just yet. This is not the craziest Air Jack incident. November the 24th, 1971 is the Thanksgiving holiday in the United States. A day off for many, but in Portland International Airport, it is just another busy day. A middle-aged man who identified himself as Dan Cooper walked into Portland Airport and used cash to purchase a one-way ticket to Seattle on North Orient Airlines Flight 305. Once on board, he took seat 18C in the rear of the cabin and had a smoke while the flight was waiting to take off. Shortly after takeoff, Cooper handed a note to Florence Schaffner, the flight attendant nearest him. Schaffner, assuming the note contained a lonely businessman's phone number, dropped it unopened into her purse. Cooper leaned toward her and whispered, Miss, you'd better look at that note. I have a bomb. Cooper opened his briefcase long enough for her to glimpse eight red cylinders. After closing the briefcase, he stated his demands, and it was quite simple. He wanted $200,000 in cash and four parachutes. He also demanded a fuel truck to stand ready to refuel the aircraft once they landed in Seattle. Should they fail to comply with his demands, he threatened to blow up the plane. For the next hour and a half, Flight 305 maintained a holding pattern near Seattle, while local and federal authorities scrambled to produce the ransom as well as the four parachutes. $10,020 bills were collected from a local bank, while the owner of a nearby skydiving school supplied the chutes. The 35 other passengers were given false information that their arrival in Seattle would be delayed because of a minor mechanical difficulty. At 5.24 p.m., Cooper was informed that his demands had been met. Flight 305 finally touched down by Seattle. By this point, it was well after sunset, and the aircraft was brought to a remote section of the tarmac. Once the flight came to a stop, both the ransom and the parachutes were handed over. In exchange, Cooper permitted to have the flight attendants as well as all the passengers to disembark, many of whom had not yet realized the flight had been hijacked. With a ransom paid and only four crew members remaining on board, Cooper outlined his flight plan to the cockpit crew that he wanted to fly to Mexico City. He demanded to fly with the landing gear down, the flaps at 15 degrees and below 10,000 feet. The lights and the cabin were to be switched off and the aft stairway which opens from the underbelly of the fuselage was to remain extended. Two of Cooper's demands could not be satisfied. First of all, the flight configuration he requested would not allow for a non-stop flight to Mexico City. The aircraft's range was limited to approximately 1,000 miles under that specified flight configuration, which meant that a second refueling would be necessary before entering Mexico. Cooper and the crew discussed options and agreed to refuel at Reno, Nevada. Second of all, it was not possible to depart with a ventral staircase extended. Cooper agreed to retract the stairs on the condition that it will be extended once the plane was airborne. 
at approximately 7.40 p.m., flight 305 took off with only five people on board. Two F-16 fighter aircraft were scrambled from McCord Air Force Base to follow behind the airliner. Somewhere between Seattle and Reno, a little after 8 p.m., the hijacker did the incredible. He jumped out of the back of the plane with a parachute and the money. Three hours later, Flight 305 safely landed in Reno. The pilots landed safely, but Cooper had disappeared into the night, and his fate remains a mystery to this day. As soon as it became clear that Cooper was no longer on board, did FBI agents converge upon the aircraft, only to discover a disappointing amount of physical evidence, a black clip-on tie, eight cigarette butts, and two of the four parachutes were all that Cooper left behind. He brought the ransom and briefcase along with him. In interviews conducted on the night of the hijacking, Cooper was described by the crew and passengers as a white male with brown eyes and dark hair. Based on this description, the FBI produced the first of several composite sketches before they could mount a search. However, the FBI had to figure out when Cooper abandoned the ship, but that was easier said than done. None of the four crew members witnessed Cooper jumping from the plane, nor the pilots of the two fighter jets which escorted the flight between Seattle and Reno, which is not all too surprising, given it was the middle of the night. The FBI mounted an impressive search operation using helicopters, airplanes, and ground troops. The loosely defined search area covered a vast stretch of mountainous wilderness. It was like finding a needle in a haystack. Apart from the difficult terrain, the search was further complicated by low temperatures and inclement weather which persisted for days. Despite their best efforts, authorities never managed to find a single trace of Cooper nor the items he brought along with him. Having made little to no progress by early December, the FBI turned their attention to the $200,000 ransom. The money had been collected from the Seattle First National Bank, which maintained a ransom package of $250,000 just for such an occasion. Because of this, the serial numbers of the $10,020 banknotes given to Cooper had been documented in advance. The serial numbers were quickly made available to financial institutions, government agencies, and the general public. The intention was to make it as difficult as possible for Cooper to spend his money. From the very beginning, it was assumed by many that Cooper did not survive his daring escape. While there is no hard evidence for or against Cooper's survival, the assumption that he fell to his death is not without merit. When Cooper leaped into the darkness, Flight 305 was plowing through a rainstorm at roughly 170 knots and 10,000 feet above southern Washington, and wind was so violent. To say that Cooper was not dressed for the occasion would be an understatement. The ground beneath him, meanwhile, was obscured by multiple layers of clouds, which likely means that Cooper jumped without knowing his precise location. Even if he could see the ground and had a specific drop zone in mind, the parachute he selected was non-steerable meaning he would not have been able to steer his descent towards a specific landing spot, thus precluding any potential coordination with an accomplice stationed on the ground. Clearly, Cooper's escape was much more of a leap of faith than a carefully executed jump. The FBI followed thousands of leads to find Cooper, considering more than 800 suspects in the five years following the incident. An Oregon man named D.B. Cooper, who had a minor police record, was one of the first persons of interest in the case. He was contacted by Portland police on the off chance that the hijacker had used his real name or the same alias in a previous crime. He was quickly ruled out as a suspect. Kenneth Christensen became a suspect in 2003 when his brother noticed certain parallels between him and Cooper. Christensen had briefly served as a paratrooper in the Second World War, and since 1953, he'd worked for Northwest Airlines as both a mechanic and a flight attendant. He was 45 years old at the time of the hijacking. He was left-handed, which Cooper might have been because Cooper used his left hand to interact with his briefcase, 
and the clip-on tie he left on board was applied fixed from the left. Shortly before he died in 1994, Christensen had supposedly told his brother, there is something you should know but I cannot tell you. After his passing, his family discovered over $200,000 in his bank accounts. To top it all off, Florence Schaffner stated that photographs of Christensen brought a strong resemblance to Cooper. On the other hand, Christensen did not match the physical description of Cooper. He was both shorter and lighter. While Schaffner did see a strong resemblance, she remarked that Cooper had more hair and that is supported by the composite sketches, and there was nothing suspicious about the large sums of money which he'd simply earned by selling land. Dwayne Weber first became a suspect in 1995 when shortly before his death, he supposedly told his wife, I've got a secret to tell you, I am Dan Cooper. Following his deathbed confession, Weber's recall a number of fascinating details. She claims she found a black back resembling the one used in the hijacking. She claims Weber had sustained a knee injury after jumping out of a plane. Weber supposedly had a nightmare about leaving his fingerprints on the aft stairs. In addition, Weber was a World War II veteran. He had an extensive criminal record. He matched the physical description, and he was 47 years old in 1971. On the other hand, Weber's fingerprints did not match any of the prints collected from Fight 305. Although, to be fair, there's no way to know if any of those prints belonged to Cooper. Furthermore, Weber's DNA did not match a DNA sample collected from the tie clasp. But once again, there's no way to know if the DNA off the tie came from the hijacker and not someone else.